the difficulty socialism experiences in gaining widespread acceptance is due to it having never developed a commercial application. Capitalism has the free enterprise model of business and communism promotes public ownership of the means of production. It will be demonstrated capitalism and communism are federal structures. Socialism is a primitive attempt to exemplify regionalism, but because it never found a way to perfect its market, it tended to bounce from left to right looking for the middle ground it was never able to find. This will be explained below. The best that socialists were able to come up with is private enterprise harnessed to a social agenda. Businesses remained private but were expected to operate as if they were cooperatives. Some referred to this model as capitalism with a conscious or social capitalism. It puts all the risk on the owner while the benefits accrue to the consumer. But tribes are rich with social networks and cooperative relationships yet remain trapped in a primitive culture that prevents the accumulation of capital. Regionalism which socialism attempted to replicate does not try and liberate communism nor humanize capitalism. Regionalism eliminates federalism without eliminating the motivation needed to ensure progress. Private ownership puts ownership in the hands of individuals or investors. But the state is still involved in registering the business and administrating the way the business operates. Capitalism, despite being thought of as free enterprise, is fully under the state and an integral part of the federalist system. Public ownership has various forms, from nationalized industries to economies which are owned by the state. Nationalization can eliminate the entire private sector. But in most communist and fascist economies there is still some private ownership. Some private enterprise, however, might be considered a criminal enterprise in how it operates. What economists rarely mention is that drug dealers and prostitutes are perfect examples of private enterprise. Naturally, socialists have concluded that private and public ownership represent the two ends of the economic spectrum and there is nothing that does not exist between the extremes. This is not the first mistake socialists have made. A priori regionalists see things differently. We promote decentralized or regional economies. The extremes of federalism are merely variations on a theme. At one extreme are individuals, and at the other is group ownership, but neither end is one of the other. Like the yin and yang symbols, each end contains elements of the other. Regionalists view the federal system as representing an ownership-based model of business. Whether the ownership is public or private. A priori regionalists promote an alternative to the federalist model that is reflective of socialism, but eliminates the remnants of federalism. Regionalism shifts power to the working class who rarely own the means of production except by proxy through the state. This makes regionalism a form of socialism but more sophisticated in how it operates. The choice for regionals is not the contrived one that compares private versus public ownership or contrasts capitalism with communism. Socialism properly understood is not a third economic model that lays somewhere in the middle of the other two alternatives. Socialism is the alternative to the federalist model of ownership. The federalist model is a centralized model regardless of where the power lays. Regionalism does not dispense with power but it lodges it securely at the base where it belongs. Socialism is the abdication or attempt to block, 
federalized forms of ownership. The regional model of ownership exemplifies the teachings of the Bible. Regionalists do not own assets. We model what the Bible calls stewardship because no one has more right to own assets than someone else. This rule goes double for the state. But this denial of private ownership eliminates the possibility of federalism. Just because one has, through a democratic process or martial law, gained power, does not give anyone the right to own or control the disposition of assets. There is no federalism without the federal model of ownership. What gives anyone the right to own a forest or a lake or large tracts of land and all they contain? In the old days of the divine right of kings, the king would own the land and all that was in or on it, including the people. This concentration of wealth and power in few hands epitomizes federalism. Ultimately, it evolves into globalism and the institution of a one-world government. The world's ideas of how federalism ought to manifest has changed since then, but the newer forms of ownership are no more justified than before. For the sake of the discussion, let's postulate the earth belongs to God. This takes it out of human hands and puts assets beyond the reach of human authority. This is a bigger problem for us than it first seems. If the state has no power over the things of God, how does it leverage obedience? Without a means of forcing compliance on others, federalism is off the table. The benefit of owning the nation is that the state has the authority to parcel out large tracts of land to its supporters. In turn these agents would subdivide what they were given and allocate them to their own supporters. This was done through the various grades of nobility in medieval times. It is still done through various means. The process is tied to political parties more, but other than that the process has not changed much. Without land and other forms of property to reward sycophants, how could the state operate federally? It needs property rights to justify its power and existence. Once we abjure the ownership of property, it is not difficult to see we have eliminated the basis of state power and therefore, the possibility of federal government. If power is blocked because ownership has been abolished the political and economic hierarchies that are crucial to federalism are also eliminated. The power of ownership we soon discover is a central feature of the federal system. Perhaps federalism does not seem as it ought to have as much impact as this discussion suggests, but consider the proposition that God owns the planet. Ought there not be serious repercussions if we claim what is not ours? How many want a free hand in how they treat the planet as if we have a right to whatever our hand can touch and our eye sees? What if we then build a life on this claim and these assumptions, but God does actually exist? Think of it this way. Adam and Eve claimed what did not belong to them and acquired the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Look at the repercussions of this. In symbolic terms, this means Adam and Eve accepted the consequences, fruit, of the tree, the system of knowledge, being the authority regarding good and evil, the nature of right and wrong. But mankind cannot draw this line nor devise a system based on authority. Adam and Eve, as the parents of the federal system, bit off far more than mankind would ever be able to chew. We ended up thanks to this disobedience, with the authority and necessity to regulate morality, but not the ability. Mankind does not have the moral authority to make or devise a moral system of governance. 
to replace that which was represented by Eden. However, Adam and Eve had already claimed what was not theirs. As humans we left the reality God had devised for us, and adopted a physical existence earmarked by work and pain. However, having become divorced from God we must rely on our own human abilities. But what have we, but our opinions based on how we feel? Our passions is all we had when we left Eden. But there was no way to allocate property by means of emotions. Land and women were fought over. Our passions gave us no way to organize our activities and so we voiced our opinions then fought over whose opinion would take precedence. In the end we ended up with federalism. The strongest and most violent man became our ruler backed up by those who were the most willing and able to serve him. They became his bodyguards and his army. Things have not changed much from the model that has existed at least since the time of Nimrod. It might be more honest if Federalists admitted they have nothing but their opinions and the ability to force others to agree with the laws of the state. The nation is a criminal organization writ large with the power to regulate it us using laws. A law is merely opinion formalized into a regulation backed up by a system of jurisprudence, but at federalism's root is the schoolyard bully and the gangster. But the world, especially we in the West, are seemingly locked into this federalist system. The nations are controlled by their governments. The opinion of governments become law and the property of the nation becomes the property of the government, to be distributed by the regulatory apparatus of the state according to the whims of the rulers. Under federalism the church is just another agency of the state. It does not have agency apart from the state. There is no way for the church to exist outside of the state in a federalist system. In this sense federalism have overtones of fascism. When we exist in a physical reality those who control the property control reality. Those who have control of the assets control the lawmaking process. So, how does anyone caught up in the Federalist trap divest themselves of its regulatory power? Sovereign citizens and others have tried. Mormons and Mennonites and even far-right libertarians have managed to separate themselves, at least partially, from the state. But this is partly because these groups are insignificant and not worth dealing with. Their existence does not challenge federalism. It is truer to say they found a niche which permits them to disengage more than the rest of us. But be it branch Davidians or sovereign citizens the legal arguments they make do not carry much weight when faced with the legal apparatus of the state. It is at this juncture when the necessity of the God hypothesis needs to be introduced. Atheists have no path to socialism. More importantly, atheists cannot find a way out of federalism. Atheists and other secularists support a federalism that permits private ownership but one subsumed under a social agenda that strips private owners of their rights. It is just one more way liberals get people to work in ways that permit the state to socialize wealth. The work is private, the profits are public. Most of the agenda of the left verges on fascism. If they do not advocate everything in the state belongs to the state, they propose that everything in the state be for the people but they need a despotic federal state to implement their charter. But how do we, if we have no faith, walk back from these federal forms of property ownership? 
It is by owning property that we give ourselves some protection from the state, and it is by the state having access to property it is able to provide a social safety net. If we own a gun, house, several acres of land, cars, investments, a pension, sizable bank accounts, credit cards, have access to a lot of government programs and a large pantry of supplies, we have some insurance against the hard times. But what if we had absolute faith in our community that whatever happened they would be there? But could they rely on us? That is the problem. Everything that we rely on for our security ultimately comes from the community we reside in. But we do not trust them, and they do not trust us, so we all attempt to protect ourselves, often with the help of the state and often to the detriment of our fellow man. However, look at the problem from another angle. What if instead of everyone being willing to help us, there was no one who wanted to harm us or see harm come to us? In this present system, if we are hungry, no one has any reason to feed us unless we have money to buy food. In the present system, it is not that no one will help, it is that help generally comes at a price. Food is owned by people who prevent us from getting it unless we pay for it first. What if this was not the case? What if no one minded if we accessed the food we needed or any of the other things we need, up to and including jobs? What if we could be assured of getting food when we needed it, even if it was not free? We might wonder how this would work, but remember in federal systems it is not just food and housing that has gatekeepers, so do jobs. We are forced to pay a premium for everything we want. People are hesitant to give people food because it has to be purchased. Nor are they certain the needy will be given jobs when the time comes to pay for the food they received. What if there were no gatekeepers controlling access to food or jobs or anything else? This is hard to imagine because we are brought up in cultures where everything is owned by someone. Yet originally if one needed a tool, one could make it. If one needed a job, it was possible to create a business. People could make or grow what was needed. When ownership was instituted as a common right it was thought a person who owned land would take care of it. An owner would preserve the value of what he or she owned. This did not prove to be the case. A gold mine only has so much gold in it. It makes sense for the gold miner to focus on getting as much gold out of the earth as economically as possible regardless of the damage done to the land. Land without the gold has no minimal value. Therefore, it is likely mining gold will ruin the land. The same goes for most extractive industries. That being said, by whose authority do gold miners find and extract gold? Who has the right to or bearing land to anyone? Apologists might argue that the prospector spent years looking for gold. Others will point to the costs of extracting gold from the soil. But these owners might have killed the original prospector, stole his claim and forced some luckless persons to do the work for them. What justifies one person profiting from a claim and what excludes others? But why is an investor justified in profiting from his or her investment? According to theory it is because of the risk they took. They spent their time and money looking for gold in an uncertain venture, so if they find gold the gold is theirs to exploit to the limit. Or they took money they obtained by some means and risked losing it by applying it to some venture. The risk the investor takes is said to justify any rewards they get. 
but by whose calculus is this situation justified? Communists see things differently. The state pays people to look for gold, thus the prospector risks nothing. The findings, if any, belong to those who funded the search, the people. In practice, however, the communist state acts more like a corporate entity than a civil one. The gold ostensibly owned by the people ends up in the coffers of the state under the control of the agents of the state. It is not shared among the people. This is to be expected because the state to have power must exercise this power through its control over property. In the same way that corporations maintain control over their employees by controlling access to commercial property, the state controls its subjects by maintaining a de facto claim to all assets within the state. The alternative to this power over property, expressed as ownership, has been portrayed as anarchy. If there is no state to regulate access to property, it is claimed there will be anarchy. Actual anarchists deny this and claim people can own property in a secure way, but history gives no example of this ever happening. The fact is, private property, unless evenly distributed, cannot be maintained without a state willing to protect the rights of private property owners. Even if physical property is evenly distributed and of such a simple design that their manufacture is open to anyone, women remain a constant source of friction. Lust has always been a reason for males to attack weaker groups. However, the more industrious one group is, compared to another, the more likely they will be attacked by their more indolent neighbors. Men who will not work seem to have enough energy to fight the productive for what they have. Ownership only protects us from the risk posed by others. If the owner or his agents have enough physical power to protect what is owned by those who express a counterclaim. For the most part both capitalists and communists have depended on the state for protection which means if there is a dispute it is settled by the state in-house, judicially, or by war. The state gets its legitimacy from its power and its power enforces its legitimacy, it has no philosophical or moral right to rule. It has no moral right to allocate property, it has no right to claim the assets of the nation as its own nor has it a moral right to claim it is a trustee of the people or its representative, not as regards the physical assets of the world. The state has the power to impose its way of thinking onto the people and the people do not see much reason to resist. The people cannot give property rights to the state and the state cannot assign rights to the people, but they have a vested interest in buttressing the federalist system. All of the state's rights, including its property rights, come down to the ability of the state to kill or threaten to kill those who oppose its rights. Under federalism, the alternatives are encapsulated as the economic and political left and right. The difference between the left and right is the amount of power allocated to the private sector versus the power held by the public sector. The number of each is always greater than zero and less than 100%. If socialism is to be compared to these models as a precursor to regionalism, we would say socialism gives power to the people but this would indicate it misses a prominent feature of regionalism. There is a distortion in meaning created by language. The state and the people are not mutually exclusive categories, nor is the public sector and private sector mutually exclusive. The people as a term includes everyone in the world or at least everyone in a nation. The state is composed of people. 
Not only do people compose the state, but those who benefit from the state and support it are people too. The state proper is composed of people who have political power and a governmental position, but many of these are mere clerks and support workers. The actual government is composed of a small number of persons with positions in the top rungs of a political hierarchy. No state would be able to wield the power it does if the state was restricted conceptually to just these persons. The state could be considered to be everyone who is a subject or resident within the borders of the nation. We are all complicit in its existence because we are all players in the federalist system. The division between the state proper and the subjects of the state is difficult to draw. But the same can be said for the business sector. Where is the dividing line between where the commercial sector ends and the state begins? The federalist system integrates all hierarchies, public and private, and both are tightly entwined. What is called public ownership is actually state ownership, and this means what is publicly owned is administrated by the state. What is privately owned is indirectly administrated by the state or administrated by proxies of the state. There is no true conflict between communism and capitalism, it is a proxy war. It looks like a war because we see a family squabble and do not see who the common enemy is. Federalism and all of its agents and agencies are aligned against regionalism. Federals oppose every attempt to flatten the hierarchy. Federalism centralizes power and oppose every attempt to divest the center of power. The center does not care if it is theocratic, atheistic, communist, or capitalist. So long as there is a focal point and a concentration of power at the center, there is unity against the federal arrangement. The enemy of federalists are Christians. Federalists are ethicists. Federalists are the divisors of laws and legal systems. It is on ethical foundations that federal systems rest. Legal systems are created and property ownership legitimized by federal law. Ultimately, there can be no solution to the ownership issue without addressing and defeating the ethicists' penchant for creating law. If we start from the assumption humans did not create reality and have no legitimate claim on the physical universe, there is no path to ownership of physical things. No law is able to change the facts. But, and this is the crucial point, we are permitted to work. Indeed, we are compelled to work. Work modifies assets and increases their value to man. It is easily to demonstrate we own the value we create through our labor, but not the value created by others. Our labor and its fruits belong to us, but the problem has always been how to discern assets from equity. Where does our value end and the value created by God begin? It is easy to see that a rock in its natural state has little value but one that has been worked on and transformed into an arrowhead has more value. The maker of the arrowhead can sell the arrowhead. But in so doing he is also selling the material from which the arrow is made. In selling a product we sell the substrate from which the product was made. In capitalism the worker is paid a wage for the work he does, but he is alienated from his work because it is the capitalist that determines what this labor is worth. He undervalues the work because he wishes to profit off the labor of his employees. How can an owner of the means of production pay his employees without legitimizing his claims to part of all of the benefits created by the labor of the worker? 
that is the real problem. But it is a problem only because it is a problem of federalism. It is a problem that cannot be solved outside of the church. And the church is a mechanism to justify faith. It is faith that serves as the foundation of the regionalist system and the church. Access to earth is inherent in the principle of dominion given by God to all men but only to bear fruit which is the church. We can own personal property but not commercial. Regional ownership requires us to live in faith. But we need not only express faith in God to prosper and bear fruit we have to express faith in our fellow man. We have to work by adding value to the assets in a way that builds up the things of God. The worker accesses assets and adds labor to them. This addition of labor modifies the asset in ways that makes it more valuable. This adding of value to assets adds value to the world, as every modification to the world's assets incrementally adds value to the market that is the reality of man. The work we do expresses faith in the community of believers. It is this work we do that adds value to the world as a work of faith that builds the church. The church is the fruit of the Spirit. Another way of understanding the church is as the value-added portion of reality, or the value we have added to the world to benefit the workers in faith. The division between us and the world is faith. Those without faith require property and governments to regulate their behavior. Those with faith live by faith in a faith-based system called a church. The purpose of man is to build the church. This is the purpose of all men because this is the logical outcome of creating value. If we do not do this, we are parasites. Socialism is the best attempt of the flesh to imagine the church. Socialist organizations are flat as the church is flat. But they can only exist in our imaginations as the people of the flesh have to weigh to implement a regional organization. Because regionalism rejects the ownership of assets, commercial property, people work for the benefit of the political jurisdiction in which they are located, known as the region in which they are located. The region of their residency owns the means of production. Working adds value to the region's assets. The regionalization of assets localizes ownership. This value created by work is called equity and is represented as an issue of preferred shares. Assets are denominated in the form of common shares and the value added to assets is measured by an issue of preferred shares. Preferred share can be contracted to prefers. Prefers, designated by the symbol then function as a currency and unit of account. The person who works and adds value to assets is paid for the labor done, using prefers as the unit of account. All who need work can find work because there is always assets available to add value to. The needs are endless. Everyone is paid for the work they do and the valued added to assets in this way the church is built, meaning the citizens of the region are benefited when residents add value to the region's assets. This is a pure socialist model of organization as it entirely eliminates the state and restores all value to its source, the person doing the work. At issue is socialism idea that the people is a thing or coherent idea. There are people who pay their own way and do not freeload off God and people who are parasites. A pure socialism takes notice of this distinction and puts power and ownership in the hands to the productive worker who adds value to the things of God.